I'm going to start this uh, session of Seeing Jazz, the Jazz Journalist Association's Master Class of Photography with Enid Farber, a longtime friend and collaborator of me and of the JJA. This mm -hmm. is our monthly um, session with the photographer, and Enid has created a wonderful uh, slideshow of many images. She's going to speak a little bit. We're going to see some photos. Uh, you can take notes of which photos you want to talk about. We will return to those photos. We're going to break this up into three different uh, batches of Enid's work that she'll uh, introduce. So, Enid Farber, welcome to Seeing Jazz. Let's go. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming. Thanks for spending Memorial Day weekend in this country and for others. Well, <laughs> join join us in celebrating our dead warriors <laughs> and barbecues. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to be here really on, on, on a Memorial Day weekend. And, um, and hopefully more people will see this in the future that are having fun today. I did prepare some notes and I told Howard I had a little accident this morning. So I'm going to read the notes as conversationally as I can uh, so that I don't have to use my scrambled brain right now, which uh, which had a little bit of a, a fall earlier. So I'm okay, but you know, it could be a little bit better to do the session, uh, bad timing, let's say. But in the meantime, what I wanted to share with you is this class isn't gonna be so much about technique as much as feeling, essence, vision, experience, passion, Anecdotes and random thoughts. I'm not the biggest on technique. Technique has never been my approach. I've learned as trial and error, and as many of us have, I'm sure, but I never went to formal training for photography. And my journey starts this way. First, I was living in Atlanta and I ended up going to Sarasota, Florida. I lived in Atlanta for a few years after college. I loved photography growing up, but I didn't really see it as my future. I really saw writing as my future. That's what I wanted to be was a writer, but I guess I didn't have enough discipline. Uh, so I ended up in Sarasota, Florida after living in Atlanta in like around 1977, 78. I ended up in Sarasota, Florida for less than a year. And that's where I ended up acquiring my first professional camera. I ended up meeting three gentlemen who lived in a little hut, I would call it, not a hut, but a little house off of a mansion on the beach. And the three guys, two of them were DJs, one a jazz DJ who's very well known, program director for former program director for WUSF in Florida, Bob Seymour. And another one was a baby photographer who is a lifelong friend, still a wonderful friend I see often. Uh, he lives in Florida still, but he comes to New York and we go out on photo expeditions from time to time. Long story short, he had a dark room and I learned my craft in that dark room. It was a little tiny dark room off of their living room backed up to their kitchen and these are three guys living on the beach who didn't like to do the dishes too often <laughs> and they're not embarrassed to hear that 45 years later it's just they were young you know three guys on a beach so the reason i tell the story this way is because when i first learned how to develop film through my friend andy i would develop the film hang it up in their bathroom it would collect all kinds of dust. Then I would go in the dark room while he was printing, sit on the toilet, hand him paper while he printed his photos of bums and babies. That's what his, those were his subject matters at the time. And he would, and I would hand him the paper, watch him do it. And then he'd go to bed. He'd say, okay, kiddo, you take over. So I would take my dusty negatives, put them in the enlarger. Then when I went to look at the print, turn on the light, dozens of palmetto bugs, you know, the big roaches would scamper in every direction. And 
I had never seen a roach in my life till I got to Florida. Never. My mother was meticulous. So I would just sit there and freeze and go, oh my God, oh my God. But you know what? I knew at that point I was meant to do this. I was meant to keep doing photography because I was so determined. I was so into it. So I said, okay, just keep going and no fear. I kept going. I kept printing all night long. And I knew if I could handle those roaches or those palmetto bugs, I could <laughs> handle anything. So I ended up, <laughs> I ended up in Sarasota for uh, several months. I got in a car accident, long story short, ended up back in, in Atlanta where my mother was at the time. Mm -hmm. And from there, my first big, actually my first, my first mu music concert that I shot was back in Tampa, Florida through the DJ Bob Seymour program director later on. He took me to see Phil Woods and I pretty sure I shot Phil Woods, his concert, I don't really remember, but mostly I was just shooting, you know, nature and stuff. And there wasn't a lot of music clubs or anything happening for me to shoot in Sarasota at the time. But I did get to see Phil Woods live. I think I took pictures. Anyway, ended up back in Atlanta. Um, sorry, in about 1977 or 78. And that's where I started to really develop my craft. Um, I never again, I, lear I learned on the job. I had jobs for other photographers in, dark, in their dark rooms. Um, I wasn't an assistant, but I was um, around a lot of professional photographers through ASMP, the Association of uh, Magazine Photographers is what it was called at the time. So I got to, um, you know, to learn a lot about the business of photography more than, more than the technique. Uh, I learned the technique on the streets. I learned the technique in the dark room. I learned the technique just by F8 and be there. F8 and be there is probably the, it's the uh, guiding principle in, in my work. Sort of reflects the Henry Cartier-Bresson School of Photography, um, the decisive moment. Those really guide me. I feel like I'm more of a photojournalist, although I love doing portraits. I'm not that much of a studio photographer. When I do shoot in the studio, it's not as organic to me as street photography, you know, as performance photography, as action photography, as photojournalism. But back to Atlanta, I lived there for about nine years. I approached the Creative Loafing uh, Weekly Arts Magazine or newspaper, let's call it, publication, let's call it. They were like the village voice of Atlanta. In fact, I think many years after I left Atlanta, Village Voice bought them out. I have no idea what their status is now because there is no Village Voice anymore, right? Um, but anyway, I approached them with the small portfolio I had amassed with some of the live photos I had shot. And so they liked what they saw and they gave me assignments whenever, I actually hustled for them. I said, so-and-so is coming to town, this, you know, it, it, it was reggae artist, it was jazz, I wanted to shoot it. And so, yeah, I got to shoot it. They paid me $10 for the photo, Ken, mm -hmm. which is about what I get paid these days. Well, actually, it's probably better than what we get paid these days. <laughs> right, Stuart? We get paid like nothing now <laughs> for much of exactly. our usage. So, but yeah, it was enough to buy film and uh, keep shooting. <laughs> so that was my investment opportunity. Kept buying the film. <laughs> Let me interrupt you and say, let's see some of those photos. Okay. Okay. And then I'll let you know about moving El Norte because that's the next. So you're right. That's a good point. A good place to start with the first part of the presentation, which is Atlanta. Now, wait, I need to go that's back to place. Zoom and go yeah. share the screen, right? Yes, ma'am. Right. You have to share the screen from where you are. Right. Okay. I think we. it should be. Okay. So you're going to run through the slideshow. We're going to um, ask the participants to keep notes on anything they want to want you to talk about specifically, 
but we'll see the several images in the slideshow and come back to talk to right. Them. Okay, uh, well, you're gonna see the first uh, section, the Atlanta section, since I'm talking about Atlanta. Right. Okay, and then we'll stop it at the New York area uh, when I move here. So here we go, it should go full screen now. See it? Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, so, so yeah, we're, we're uh, mid eighties. Um, so these two images are the same, Miles and the hand colored version. Hand coloring is one of my specialties. The first time that photo was published, they ran it horizontally, but it was shot vertically. So we can talk about that later. The sun at the moon, sun raw at the moon shadow cafe lent itself to one of my favorite parts of photography is creating titles, the sun at the moon. So uh, again, a hand colored version of Ray Charles and another one in the same venue, uh, Bobby and Betty and uh, Dexter Marion backstage type shots. I love, I just always love doing those backstage shots. And in those days, I was the only one. So it was, it was easier to, to have, you know, a nice uh, in, interaction with the musicians. I had music going, but it wasn't working. We tested it the other day and it wasn't working. So it makes this presentation a little more dynamic with the music, but we'll save that for another time. Now, Ernie Gregory is a great jazz photographer now. He ended up working with Winton at Jazz at Lincoln Center. But back in the day, he was uh, a DJ and always in my camera, not in front and back of the camera. He was in front of the camera. Uh, I just like the, the, the one on the right of Amina is very recent in 2021, but I'm just juxtaposing it with the one of her from Atlanta. Okay. So we're gonna pause it here because this goes into the New York. Let me see. I have to hit escape. Okay. So I'm gonna stop the share for a minute. Right. Okay. So that first section is very, you know, very few photos from the day of uh, my development, but uh, randomly chose them because you know they represent different aspects of my work, uh, performance backstage, on stage, um, some portraits, and um, hand coloring. Can we go back to the um, Witten and Branford shot? That's pretty well known. Yeah, yeah. OK, I'll go back to share screen. Sorry. Um, so that one, I in this presentation, I was going to read to you the idea behind doing the presentation this way or the session. Um, yeah, I, I just love juxtaposing photos. Uh, I wrote a whole note about that. I, I've never shown these two together, but because I chose them for this presentation, when I started laying it out and designing it, I said, you know, I just love, I love those two together. I love them apart. But what I, and I also, you'll notice my photos, I, when I've done exhibits, I've always tended to show them in sepia tone at my exhibits. But there are some photos that just have to be black and white. And the Chico Freeman and Cecil McBee is a stark, literally and figuratively example of that for me. However, Winton and Bramford, that image is also not only a sepia tone photo from a black and white original negative, but I've hand colored it. It's I've got a pretty. It's been published several times too. The hand colored version. It's very very different. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a matter of preference. The reason I started hand coloring, and I think this is probably something interesting for other photographers to hear, is goes back harkens back to that ten dollar check I would get to pay for my film. You know, the the big budget that I had in those days. Uh, facetiously, she says. Um, I, I would get requests for color images and I didn't have them because I couldn't afford the color film. You know, I couldn't develop it myself. So I'd have to get a lab to develop it. And I really, as much as I love black and white, I still wanted to shoot color because I knew it had more 
you know, wide usage and potential for magazines and so forth. Um, but then I happened to work one of my part-time gigs or no, not part-time, but what do you call it? Day gigs was working for a woman who was a portraitist. She was actually, when I say a portraitist, sorry, she restored portraits. She was a painter. She was a literal, literally a, an artist with a brush. Um, I worked for her to printing her, her photos. And then I would start the hand coloring process. So I would tint the photos. Then she would actually take brushes and real paint, you know, not Marshall's photo oils, which is what I used at the time to start the photos, to tint them. She would take actual paint and create a, like a, a, a painting, a, 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 um, a huge oil painting. A lot of those were re restored photos that she worked on. Some of them were um, just, were just, um, what do you call it? Uh, like, you know, back in the day they had Sears and a place called Olin Mills, I think, <laughs> if I recall, that where they would, um, they would take, they would take those photos to her to create an oil painting out of them instead of just a, a photo. Okay, so point being, um, she, she had, she had these, uh, this dark room in her house and I print on this old, big old and larger, like we, we printed eight by 10 and four by four by five negatives mostly. Cause some of her pictures, some of the pictures were blown up to, you know, huge proportions, 30 by 40. And she would again, paint them. So I learned hand coloring that way uh, back to, so back to this Miles Davis one which uh, which I shot in Atlanta. Um, that uh, That's the black and white version, which I sepia toned. So I always sepia toned it before I would hand color. If I hand color right on the black and white, it, it just, it's, it doesn't have the same warmth. I'm oh, dealing with African-American skin usually, you know, not always, but I feel, I feel like that just gave the base of the, portrait of the photo, what it needed to do the actual coloring. So my coloring technique was learned through this woman, but she didn't teach me anything. I just, again, I just, I just used the Marshall oils rubbed on the paint just to give it a base. And then I'd watch her use the brushes. When I started doing it to, with my own work, I used cotton in my fingertips and I just kept applying layer after layer after layer and I built it up. So my intention was for it not to look like necessarily an oil painting, but to look not necessarily like a photograph, some, somewhere in between. So it's, um, you know, I used to see you the- sell those, You sell those prints. Pardon me? You sell those prints. Oh yeah, yes, yes indeed, yes. Um, this one of Miles has been seen, it's been published, but I, I think it's one of the first promotional postcards I made. And to this day, I still um, uh, have a big stack of the other Miles Davis postcard, which everybody's probably seen of, uh, well, you can see the picture there, but it's uh, uh, somewhere here. Anyway, everybody's seen it. It's Don't worry. On the wall. Um, and that's a hand colored one too, but that's from Saratoga uh, a, year, a year after this one. This one, uh, two years after this one, I shot this in 83, then I moved to New York in 85 and that shot miles for the second and only, you know, one of two, only one of two times that I've shot him, um, then I shot him. So anyway, I'm jumping around, but as far as the hand coloring, I still love doing it, but after many, you know, I used to do all my own printing in the dark rooms that I had, I always had never had like a fancy dark room. I had just set it up wherever I could. It was my bathroom, my bedroom, uh, my kitchen. I would block out the light and I would, I would um, create a dark room, a makeshift dark room. Sometimes I'd have to fill up the trays, go to the bathroom, down the hallway, bring the chemicals back into the bedroom, and then bring it back to the bathroom to wash them and 
uh, I was pretty determined. I, you know, I didn't have I didn't have any any money to to really do to do anything the way I felt like I could have made a lot more advancement in my career if I'd had a little capital. But I just kept pushing along and you know needed to do it. It was in my soul. I had to do it. Uh, so. Uh, I, I printed in, in many different dark rooms that were were very, very substandard. But I was a good printer because I also worked for another photographer who was um, a commercial photographer, very well known, Chuck Rogers, who was famous for his one photo. He was an Atlanta photographer, uh, one photo of runners in the Atlanta road race and uh, Peachtree road race. And this, and this print bought him this print at the end of the race with the, all the, the, uh, the, the runners collapsed, brought him Porsches and homes and wow. he, was, he, he made so much money off of that one image. You know, hmm. he didn't have a lot of other like well-known work or this kind of commercial guy with, you know, with, with good work, but nothing that interesting or special but he did really really well on that one photo that picture was in american photography magazine yes that's right hey andy yeah this is hey. andy. it was the guy who was one of the guys in the dark room <laughs> he was the guy with the brooches and <laughs> he's here my <laughs> great thanks thanks I, i've told this story a lot of times when you weren't there andy so uh yeah i know i heard about it you let's, for me. But yes, he did, let's move on to going to uh, New York. Okay, so so I'm just going to uh, what I was going to say that after um, nine productive and informative years in Jersey City, I moved El Norte. Uh, I was uh, building my brand while I lived in Jersey City. That, well, I moved El Norte. I'm sorry, go back to Atlanta. After living in Atlanta, I moved to El Norte to Jersey City where I lived for six years, building my brand, finding my place in the very competitive dogs eating dogs world of jazz photography, sometimes for better and other times for worse. And then in 92, I moved into Manhattan. And as much as I sincerely can say, I wish I'd had a much easier time of it. I prevailed, I continued, I pushed through a lot of struggles to claim my piece of the big apple pie. And gratefully, I'm still here, always finding where there's a will, there's a way to point my camera in the direction of that which I love the most. Whether it's the music, the streets, the beautiful people or animals or landscapes or inanimate objects that are my subjects. And this destiny continues to consume my heart no matter how many gigs paid or not. I am lucky enough to attend, whether on a guest list or not, or for a publication or not, or a record company or not, or just myself in history, which always in the end is ultimately what counts. I wanted to read that because that is my mantra. It's what counts because for me, this is a history. It's about history. Um, it's more than just, you know, a paid gig. It's, it's really, it's, I really feel like whether I, whether I'm thriving from this personally, financially, I'm leaving some history. You know, this, this is my legacy because I don't have children. I won't have grandchildren. And these, this is my work, and it, hopefully it will survive me. So on that note, on that, I hope inspiring, if not, you know, whatever, winsome note, here is uh, my New York photo section. Again, ra randomly chosen photos. Uh, some are grouped together for the aesthetics. Some are grouped together because of a hand, hand gestures or a mood or well, you decide. I'll, we'll talk more about it later. Uh, let me start this again from this slide. Okay. You can see the screen, right? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Now, you guys, this is where you start singing because the music didn't work out. Fathers of Jazz Photography, uh, at the top, what's wrong with this picture? Well, there weren't a lot of women doing this at once upon a time. There are a lot more now. 
Um, that is the New York section, but I might have thrown in a photo from from the past as well, just because I like the way they work together. Uh, I call it, you know, New York and beyond. So we get from that, that Miles photo was the other one I was referring to. And then this is a dedication of the Miles Davis uh, way in New York with Sicily photographing the, the crowd. I love those two photos together. <laughs> They're just both so wacky. Two hand colored pieces, uh, Jerry Allen and, well, I decided to pair her with her ex Wallace who were both unfortunately gone way too soon. These two are hand colored as well. And there's Ernie again, Ernie Gregory. Everyone knows Ernie from being a photographer, but you probably didn't know him before he was a photographer. And that was the Atlanta days. Uh, this won an award, the Illinois Jaquette won an award from um, Musician Magazine, the art director entered it into a contest and it won an award with him. Uh, yeah, don't mean a thing if it ain't on that swing, so. That was a liner, that was on a liner, wasn't it? I, I don't, I don't, I don't know, I don't remember, I don't think so. Mm. That was my Sammy section and then Sammy walked in. That's a good story with Michelle Camilo. I took my dog to see, to see, to that shoot for downbeat. I just said, can I bring my dog? I didn't want to leave him at home. All you people with dogs, you understand. He was, he was my appendage. And yeah, I shoot more than just jazz. I was really into a lot of, I was a big reggae fan for many years. I met Bob Marley and got to ride in a limousine with him. That's another really fun story where he laughed at my Chinese slippers that I was wearing at the, at the time that were in vogue, by the way. These two never paired together, but I just, I love seeing them together as much as individually. Did you create the white backgrounds or is that happenstance that they were against white walls? Um, no, it was, it was, it was uh, well, I, you know, the one with um, Howard Mayburn was at the Time Warner Center at uh, CNN Studios. So I think it was a big window in the background. Yeah. So yeah, that was, but the one of Jerry was backstage at Carnegie Hall and it was a white background. The same, Are same hand colored? And the same session as the hand colored one that I showed earlier. I have a lot of photos from that, that session. So uh, and I did have some actual color photos I shot. Uh, that's a double exposure on the left, an accidental double exposure. So Bill Clinton is not actually conducting the Dizzy Gillespie Memorial Funeral Band, but it was way before Photoshop and it was a lucky accident. Just like those two shots that they look like they were posing purposely together. It's what I love about photography, capturing that what you both look like you're you were rehearsing that pose right um that, that one is the jazz journalist photo of the year back in 2003 already right yeah and that's the year i got the photography award and that photo and it was for this shoot called moving on uh with claire she used a different photo on the cover, but I think she used that other one on the, yeah, she used that on the back, on the booklet, the one that won the award. That's me feeding Herbie Hancock a grape in the, in the, at the uh, blue note in the, in the green room <laughs> and in the bathroom. I made him come in the women's bathroom with me. I was, I was a little bit, uh, I don't know, a lot different then. I was just a little, a little, uh, let's do whatever. Come on, Herbie, come in the women's bathroom. I want to photograph you in there. You, you know, I had, a, I had more, what's the word? Less fear? Chutzpah. But chutzpah. Chutzpah. I knew there was a good Jewish word for that. That's recent. Her, that was it. Uh, Archie's wife handing him a saxophone to, to uh, rehearse for the Charlie Parker Festival last year. He wasn't doing too good, to be honest. But, but this, on the other hand, look who's still 99. He was 98 when I shot that in last year. 99 now, everyone's celebrating his birthday. So amazing, 
my father just turned 99 and it, Marshall Allen makes my dad look really pathetic. I hate to say, it. don't tell him I said that, but I'm telling you, this guy is what I, I want to have what he's eating, you know, and it's smoking cigarettes. He's still smoking cigarettes, Marshall Allen. Hmm. That's why I put that in there. You had to, you had to see this man still smokes cigarettes and he's 99 and still playing that sax like a 20 year old yeah. or, 20, or 25 year old. That's a hand colored one on the right of Charlie Watts, another hand colored one. And he was doing a gig for called, I call it from one Charlie cause it was for Charlie Parker and Ella. And then Bobby McFerrin holding an Ella cookie at Lincoln center celebration uh, or Ella. Sue well, Claire asked if you're using Photoshop to do the hand coloring now. Um, Snit at the knit. Don't forget that one. It, you can ask Howard about that or not. Um, I, yes to no. I, I, I am using it, but not as much as I'm using now pastels. I found, so that's, that's what I was almost talking about earlier, that it took me all these years between when I did the bulk of my hand coloring back in the early 90s, I'd say. Um, it took me all these years to discuss, to, to find the right paper because now digital paper, that's the digital paper. Um, I'm not printing with conventional paper anymore. So to find something that would adhere to digital paper, I finally found it. And it's something called pan pastels, pan pastels. And that is how I do some of it now i still print it digitally and i can take a color photo and print it in black and white and then hand color on it or uh, or i can take a color the photo and and add more oh, color to it with the, with the pen pastels and hmm. it, it creates a beautiful a beautiful uh you know texture to the photo mm. added layer so that yeah. no i don't use the oils anymore not the the, uh, the the Marshall photo oils. I haven't used those in years because they don't work on digital paper. They will work on some of my older prints, but you know they they're all dried up now. That's the problem with the Marshall's oils; they dry up pretty quickly. All right, I think we're almost at the uh, that's hand colored of Nina Simone. Um, the one of Cindy Blackman Santana. I have a hand colored version in with those pastels I mentioned but it's in an exhibition right now. I think Robert, you saw that exhibition and uh, if Robert Sutherland's still there, you saw the exhibition and, and that was with those pan pastels. So I know I'm cramming in a lot of info, but you asked. I love this, because there she is. That's um, colored on the left. And this is last summer and she's grabbing her camera at yeah. the end of the concert. And, doing like Cicely Tyson did and photographing the audience. And she was really into it. I have a whole sequence of, of that, Diane Reeves. All right, we're almost into the last section, which will be a lot of dead people. Okay. Well, yeah. let's go back and, and look at some of those yeah. more yeah. closely. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I guess, I'm wondering why you 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 you've juxtaposed these so well. I, they do seem to be a book sort of setup. Yeah. Have you approached uh, or thought, you know approached that challenge that task? Well, many years ago, I think you probably remember when I had some ideas <laughs> and um, was flushing them out. I do have a uh, template of a book. Called this is crazy. Mute whoever's talking. Yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah. Um, I um I have that that template of a book called Legends Who Passed Through My Lens. Uh -huh. Re retitled here, a few notables who passed through my lens because it's not the complete volume. But you know that book. Um, I realized, geez, that's kind of a never-ending concept. You know. They're, they keep passing through my lens. They keep passing on. Uh, I did 
have I had somebody who wanted to collaborate with me to writing it. And then I started putting it together and finding and designing it on my own with those templates that they have for books. Now it was a company that I don't know if they're in business anymore, but it came out beautifully and I was writing my own anecdotes and captions. Uh, yeah, I just never really, never really got out there the way I should have with it. And I still am not quite sure how I want and to do a first book, whether I want it to be comprehensive, but I do have a lot of ideas, you know, especially with putting my photos together. Cause like I said, that I wrote this, I wrote this in my notes. It's, it's very valuable part of the exercise for me. Mm -hmm. um, I love, I almost love that part as much as I do the photography is when I see the way photos work together, whether it's, you know, two of, two or three of the same person or, or, you know, or this one of Eddie Palmieri and Ornette. I mean, just the clothes, you know, it's, it's so much fun. It's so much fun. Look at, look at the, what they're wearing and, and, and yet there's a different vibe or, yeah. um, I mean, these two are just because it happens to be father and son 20 years later, you know, just a coincidence. It's exactly 20 years mm -hmm. apart in two different parts of the country. Um, we see the, um, the group shot from Max's um, funeral. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's see. There it is. Um, okay. The, the group shot was right here. Yeah, that in. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that was. Uh, that but, was let me yeah. see if I can. Yeah. Somebody's getting heard, Anna, and we don't want to hear them. Can you blow that up, Annie? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to. Let's see. I'm going to say play from current slide and then try to put it on pause if I can. Where do I pause? Right here. Okay. Okay. There we go. Is that good? Can you see it? Uh, screen? No. It needs another second. Oh. No, it needs to. Well, I was trying to pause it. I thought. Uh, I no, but I didn't. It's not loaded all the way on my screen. Oh, really? Okay. All right. How do I pause this? Um, you uh, want here. to start it again. Yeah, I did. I did. Uh, oh, okay. Zoom share. Let me go back. Back. Okay. I, okay, I can hit pause. Okay. This is pause. Oh, I'm pausing share. No, I don't want to do right, that. Fine, fine. Yeah, yeah, oh. I don't, honestly, I don't quite uh, should. Okay, let me do this. Let me try something else. If I just click on it. Hold on. Um, yeah. All right. Well, is that a little okay? Bit? Okay, that's good. I could open it up in Photoshop. So, did you, did you um, organize these people to stand together? Yeah, yeah. I, it was it was very it was a very uh, very crazy rushed and and incredible you know opportunity. I think Bobby Sanabria um, helped me do that. Yeah. Who's down in right in the middle with holding right. his hand yes. over his hand yeah. Oh. yeah. So uh after the after the funeral, I think we talked about the possibility of doing it before the before I saw him, you know, before the funeral started. And then and then afterwards we just you know, he says, Okay, you know, let's let's make it happen. I said, Yep, let's do it. And you know, I ran across the street to Grant's tomb and he gathered the, the guys up and I got them as much as I could to be able to see everybody and get everybody's attention and, and make it happen. It was, it was fast and furious. Like a lot of my photos of, of this nature are, you know, there's no big production involved. Trust me. It's, 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 it's very photojournalistic. Can you have the uh, uh, list of who all these people are? The what? Do you have a list of who everybody is here? Um, I, I do, I do. I don't have it on me at the moment, but I, I think, you know, I have most everybody uh, listed, I, you know, through the help of okay. other people in the photo. And, but yeah, I mean, uh, there's, uh, I'm sure you recognize me. I mean, there's, you know, Lee in the photo. Yeah, hearing background noise. Oh. Mabel, that may be you. I don't know. No, not me. Not me. Um, uh, there's, 
so Enid, I you have a great shot that uh, that um I guess I saw on mm -hmm. Facebook or something from inside the funeral, um that I don't I I think you were just seeing his drum kit or something. It was, I think that was part of it. But I sent it to his son Daryl, <laughs> Max's son, who's a friend of mine. I don't know what happened there. Oh, I heard that too. Mm -hmm. I don't know where that's coming from. No, Mabel. I think Mabel. It says Mabel. It's Mabel. Mabel, please mute. Um, you know how to mute me? Oh, <clears throat> uh, there is. It's this this photo right here. Um, yeah, it was one with Sunny. Yeah. 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 No. Right, and and the, exactly, and the drum. So I sent that uh, to to his to yeah. Max's son. Exactly, oh, that was the photo. Yes. Oh, thank yeah. you. I'm so glad. I I'm not. I don't have any, you know, uh, any connection with him. So. That's great. And oh, come on. Those two together. Uh, this is amazing. Excuse me, Mabel. Mabel, we can hear you. We can hear every word you're saying. There's a mute button. Yeah. There's a mute button okay. on the lower left. Just click it, and it'll become red and say unmute. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. Anyway, there. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you, Stuart, for doing that. Uh, oh, so sure. There's the mute button. Um. So yeah, that that photo is, um, it it was just it was just a really great, you know, my version of the great day in Harlem. It was a great day in uh, in at Riverside Church, basically at Graham's tomb. <laughs> Um, but you know, again, like that photo I have of the father's jazz photography. What is missing here? What's wrong with this picture? There is one. There are two women in that. You can see Sylvia Cuenca right there. She's there. Out, and then there's. I think that's Cecilia Smith over there. I don't see any other women. And there are, you know, I don't know who uh -huh. percussionists were there at the time, but but I'm sure there were more, um, but not that many, right? Mm -hmm. uh, glad to see that there's more women percussionists now. But, but, uh, I don't know who that is. Does anybody know who that is? That's not okay. No, that's not a woman. Anyway, um, yeah, nothing against men. Trust me, I'm not like that. But you know, I'd like more pictures to be like this, right? You know, those JJ women that won that year, and and this fierce, this these fierce women. That's a pretty, I would say, pretty uh, nice representation. So, okay, enough said. Any other questions about any of these? Uh, the Steve oh, Swallow, how did you, um, on the Steve Swallow, is it like selectively in focus? Um, yes, 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 indeed. This was used on his CD, but not this way. So this is, this is a little bit of post postpartum treatment. <laughs> Postpartum, post-production, sorry. Post-production treatment, yes. And again, you know, I, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not too classic in, in my approach to jazz photography. Uh, I know black and white is, is, this, is, is the preferred look and, and what is expected. But when I say black and white, that's what I mean by black and white, you know, monochromatic. You know, that's, uh, I did a little bit of that there too. So I, I, I like to, um, I like to sometimes, um, I mean, most of these photos are totally straight, straight, you know, straight out of the camera, uh, straight ahead with, with a little bit of tweaking, just, uh, just to make it look the best it can on, on screen or in publication, if it needs a little contrast or a little, a little color balancing. I mean, we all do that, right? But with the black and whites, uh, they're pretty much, you know, besides dodging and burning, they're pretty much as is. This is and one of the most unusual art ensemble shots because- How do I see the photos? Because few people are able to get them together. Yeah, yeah. You know what, Howard, it was, it was another really incredibly, meaningful moment for me and and i had i had um this is 1987 i only moved to new york to, in 1985 
and I was in Chicago. I'm sorry, Chicago, the San Francisco. And I saw them there in, I guess that year earlier, or maybe the year before. Um, and I, I, I don't quite remember how, how that happened too, but I know when they came to SOBs, I, I just said, I really, really, really want a portrait of these guys. They're, they're just, you know, they're so special. And I love the fact mm -hmm. that, nice. that only three of them are still on their makeup. Cause you know, they used to take the makeup off when they went backstage and then put it back on, you know, I mean, in between sets, right? Did you know well, that? Well, never, Rasta never wore makeup. Right, right. That's true, but... but I don't think Lester did very often either, the Trump. Well, okay, but okay. I think you're, uh, yeah, you're, right. you're probably going to wear some. I mean, I think I have Lester... I have to look through the negatives, but I feel like I have him in some makeup. But but, but I, I don't remember on this gig whether, but they, <laughs> apparently they would take it off in between sets so mm. and reapply it. Does, does anybody know if that's true? Or if I'm just imagining that somebody told me that and it's not true? I don't know. That, that would be a lot of work to take that off and put it back on. You know? Maybe not as much as it looks like. You know, I mean, it's just, maybe they were just, yeah, yeah, yeah. That looks like Joseph doesn't have much on. So maybe it was just it was him just to take it off. I don't I don't know, but I, I remember getting that, that information. and. But yeah, you're right. Roscoe didn't, but I think Joe, I think uh, Lester might have. But it it was a nice, great moment. And then uh, this this was I have pictures of you from this from this uh, project <laughs> stage. Some great stuff, Howard. Um, that's one of that. There were two different events uh, for the Don Cherry at Black. I mean, for the Ed Blackwell project that I shot. This was uh, 1990. But there was the other one at um, St. Peter's Church. I don't mm -hmm. remember where. I might have an image in here somewhere from that. But that I have you backstage with with somebody. Okay. Dewey Redman, I think. Yes, Charlie and uh, yeah. Dewey Redman and yeah. uh, Branford. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so I have, I have a quick question. So a lot. I, number one, I love the backstage photos. I um. And they, it seems like a, a lot of them are from the 1990s mm. or that period, and then even more recent. Um, I love doing those too, but it's, I find it's impossible these days to get that kind of access, at least in at where I live. Um, You're number right. one, you know, like SF Jazz is horrible about doing that, um, and the clubs. So I'm wondering if you're if you're having problems getting access to kind of backstage vent, you know, like to the, at the venues. I am, I am, yeah, I am. I I haven't proven myself yet, apparently. <laughs> nor, obviously, nor have I. Hardly, you know, but... hardly anyone that, that has that has the power to give me access even knows who I am, to be honest, Stuart. I, I, it's just, I think it's management more so than, than the artists. No, you no know? Not the, it's not the artists, I'm, it's, it's, it's management, it's the venues, it's the, um, it's it's the publicists, the promoters, the all that, you know, all those people that ha the handlers, you know, mm -hmm. you know, most of them, they, they either they know or they they know and they just are very you know very um, very protective. They're like the gatekeepers, the you know, to the CEO and um, or they or they just have their their own photographers that they work with and they don't want to give you access. So that's part of it. Um, also, there's when I was doing a lot of this, I really wasn't um, in that much competition with other photographers. There weren't not, you know, there weren't other I, I was pretty much um, honestly and, and, and selfishly. I, I, if there were other, five, ten other photographers backstage all vying for the same photo, why should I do it? it Come on. Sense. You know, I wanted to be there and okay. be. Uh, and, and really have an, a, a personal interaction. And that's that's how I, I, had, I was spoiled from my years in Atlanta, being the only one doing uh, it. Position. Okay. Click it. So, Mabel, please. Mabel, please mute yourself. Can you mute yourself, please? I don't. I can't. Turn down your volume, then. Yeah, just turn your volume down. Oh. 
now. Okay, so does that so so yes, Stuart, we can commiserate together. <laughs> this and this and and other stuff, but yeah, it's really been. I know it's like I can't. You know, I I don't even try anymore to yeah. do that, yeah. and and it's, so it's very limiting. So yes, shame. Yeah, but you know, I couldn't have created these pictures if there were if there's twenty other photographers. Just standing leave right. it because I couldn't figure it out. Sorry. So, okay. Anyway. You want to show the last batch, or is yeah, yeah. People let's want to that. comment on any of these other photos or um, ask. You uh, just kind of go where you're interested in the music, it seems like, yes? Sorry, sorry, Howard. Um, can you, you, you go where you're interested in the music. You go to the places that you're interested in the music, oh, and then yeah. you shoot, yes? Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever been assigned to a gig of, of, of a musician or performance that I didn't care about, you know? Um, yeah. So... Uh, what else? I like these together because, uh, you yeah. know, they're two different recording sessions and this is about, uh, history right here. This is, this, this has so much context. 2021, everybody was still masked up. In fact, they're still wearing masks if they just took them off for this, for this, uh, this one, this is for tomb records. And, uh, usually it's, it's, uh, it's it's more about the the portraits of the musicians than the recording session itself, um, but I just I like showing those together for, again about designing pages or books or whatever. You know I, it's not so much about the the two matching expressions as it is about a, a complete historical context here. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, of the era of, and um, I mean here, you know, I again, what what's what do these have to do with each other? Well, they're both portraits I did. This was for her CD, uh, Claire CD. This is for Alan's uh, publicity shots, or for no, I think it was a magazine shoot. I don't know. I don't remember. Two thousand and three. God help me. Alan, are you there? Tell us what that was for. But anyway, uh, there's horses in both of them. Okay. So okay. that's, that's why I juxtapose those two. Yeah, but you didn't know you were doing that when you shot the photos. So. No, of course not. So that's what I'm saying. It, it, this, is the, this is the fun I have. These two of Henry, his 80th birthday party, he was, uh, it was Margaret threw a, a concert in a church on the Upper East Side. I forgot the name of the church. And then he played at a, at a, um, an art, uh, a, uh, what do you call it, a gallery. Uh, it wasn't um, Zercher. I can't remember the name of the gallery. I, it's in my, it's it's in but, my files. But yeah. uh, it just like those two together, it's like a cross. It's kind of got a spiritual thing happening, a religious thing happening. Although none of these people were probably very religious. So, um, and uh, I mean this, these two. I have I have a couple more photos that fall in that category of just it just. This is this is the decisive moment. I mean, I'm sure 20 seconds later, they did not have the same pose and the same biting their 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 nails or whatever they're doing. And then you've got Al Jarreau and John Hendricks. You know, they look like twins. They look like twins. It's just it's just a uh, it's just it's just one of those photos that that has some sort of uh, magic to me when you catch the expressions the the joy, the emotion, and, and, and the profile where they look like twins, right? Uh, so I'll are, just, you, are you shooting a lot in order to come to those frames? You uh, shoot and shoot and shoot and then go well, back and look at you that got? Was pre, that was pre-digital, you know, at least, uh, at least this one was. Uh, Jazz and Democracy 2003, I probably just had my first digital piece of junk camera. It was a Nikon something something, something. It was a very, very, you know, low, low resolution digital. I mean, it was high resolution at the time, but compared to now. So that one might have been digital, because this is actually a color image that I, I'm showing in black and white to, to kind of pair with this one. Um, 
but this is 1996. So yeah, I mean, I shot, I shot enough roles of film, but not a lot. I, I couldn't just shoot endlessly. No, I had to shoot pretty, a little bit more sparingly, a little more judiciously. Mm -hmm. the, you know, again, the budget or the, I wasn't being, it wasn't being, uh, if I sold the photo to a magazine, it might have, this might not have been an assignment. I might have just been there as one of many photographers and maybe it got published somewhere. I don't recall on this particular mm -hmm. one. But yeah, I wouldn't say I was shooting, not like these days where you can just, you know, bang off a thousand frames and hope you get one good one, right? Yeah, yeah. That's not the way, it's not the way I generally work anyway, but yeah. But this one, that brings me to this one. This is, again, pre-digital. 1991 and 1992. Well, what's happening here? You see what's happening? Does anybody know what's happening here? Anybody want to take a guess? Nobody knows. <laughs> that's, that, that's Billy. That's Billy Wild Bill accepting his nomination for his first run as president, accepting the nomination as the Democratic candidate. There's Hillary right there. Why is that coming up? There's Hillary in the background. Does anybody, did anybody know that was Hillary? Oh. Okay, there she is. And so I shot that event. I, I had volunteered on the Clinton campaign and I actually was, was driving in the motorcade. I was, I was actually a volunteer driver for the motorcade before his official nomination, I was allowed to do that. Now I wasn't driving him and I wasn't driving his staff, but I was driving members of the press in the New York tri-state tri region. Um, I was still living in Jersey City. So I would, I think, uh, come into Manhattan and meet wherever. And, or maybe I, once I went out to uh, Teterboro Airport when he came and I have photos of him on the uh, tarmac. Long story short, we ended up, I would, drive around, go from campaign stop to campaign stop. And I got out and I would have my little Nikon FM2 and I'd have a roll of black and white film in. And then I would maybe want to shoot some color. So I'd take the black and white film out. I, if, every, if anyone remembers the day of when you had to pull the leader out, uh, you know, and you, if you wanted to re, reuse it, you, you have to mark it and go, okay, advanced the number 20. On it. Right, advanced to the number of expo last exposure. Yeah, yeah. You you do that, and you you know you keep your lens cap on so you can advance to frame twenty without. And reload it. So I reloaded that color neg uh, slide film into the camera. We with, like this stuff. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I reloaded that that slide film and um, forgot it, it in 1992 during Dizzy Gillespie's memorial where I had forgotten to mark the leader and got this double exposure. <laughs> like really, I, and to this day, it's one of my favorite photos because come on, Good. there he is conducting the, 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 the memorial band with, with all these greats who, how many of them are still left? Uh, Byron, we have Byron still, we have Winton and we have Fattis, right? The yeah. rest are all gone. Um, so that's that story. So that if you talk about film, Howard asking me, did I just keep shooting and shooting? Well, not always because yeah, there were times when I couldn't, I just couldn't afford to even have two cameras. So I'd have to keep switching back and forth. You want to show the final section in it? Sure, absolutely. Let's go there and it's shorter than the middle section, sort of like the, and this is, um, uh, not all of these are from that, book that I thought I would publish, but because I added many since then, there are a couple of color thrown in, the book is all in sepia tone, but um, it is based on my ideal legends who passed through my lens. So let's go back to, I have to get up to the top there. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, wait a minute. I'm trying to get this, this thing out of the way. Got to hide this, uh-oh. What did I do? I just added a slide, sorry. Ah. Okay, technical glitch. Just go up to the slideshow and start it if you can. 
No, but this, I have to get rid of I know, but it only lasts for five seconds. Yeah, I'm trying to go to slideshow, but I've got this, this uh, Zoom thing in my way. I got it. I got rid of it. Okay. Play from current slide. Here we go. Here we go. I had to get that bar out of the way. All right. Ready? Okay. So Hampton, 10 years, of, what, how many years apart? 10 years? No, 20 years. Wait, 10 years. My math. Uh, older chick and young chick. First time I photographed him in Atlanta as a young chick. And well, we all know about Margaret and Henry, don't we? Do we all? Most of us do, right? And I just uh, wanted to give tribute to Yvonne Irvin, who was so important and special to so many of us. Passed on way too soon. There's those photos, Stu. I wish the music was playing. It just feels so much better with the music, but, and that's at, uh, at uh, Miles Davis's memorial at St. Peter's where so many great legendary musicians have been memorialized or buried, had their funerals or memorials. And there we go, that, that's the one you were at, Howard, one on the left, at least wow. one photo. Yeah, the other black wall. And there's a hand colored version of both of those that just passed. And this one too, I have a hand colored version, which I really like. So do you have any technique for getting these people to open up to you that are very, seem very engaged with you, these portraits? There's no technique. No, there's, there's no technique. It's just, I, I guess that's, that's my, my own, my one tool is having um, is having that ability to get people to feel relaxed and comfortable and, 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 and maybe it's just my own exposing my own sense of in vulnerability. Um, I don't know. I get a little, a little too excited maybe when I'm photographing them, you know, and maybe they respond to that or, or whatever it is. I, I, I think somebody said at the beginning of this, instead of reading my notes, just be me. That's all I can do, you know, for better or for worse. I mean, I don't know how I got all of them to, I think he had his shirt off. I didn't get him to take it off. No, I won't take credit for that. <laughs> uh -huh. I won't take credit. <laughs> but, um, you know, again, I, I will admit I was, I was a lot less a lot of a lot more chutzpah, as Stu said, and a lot less uh, intrepid, or more intrepid, or less intrepid. I don't know than I am now. I feel like I've I've become a little more shy in my older years. Does that make sense? Well, if you say so. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, know. you know better than anybody, but you you do catch a lot of great decisive moments, beautiful expressions. Oh my God! You're you close to people, and they. They're looking at you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. There's a lot of variety in your shots. You don't seem to have a um, a standard shot that you keep going back to. Yeah, you're right about that. And that's the other thing. And again, that's why I consider myself more of a photojournalist, you know, because um, it really is, it really is about responding to the, the, the everything, the environment, person. Um, and I, I, I'm not looking for any kind of uh, signature style at all. Uh -huh. If somebody asks me, what is my style? I don't know. Does anybody have an answer? Because <laughs> it's just, it's just, uh, and it's also, I, I want, I want to share, you know, joy. I wanted to be spread the joy and of the of these people who I I revere what they give us, and I think that that's what guides all of us in this music photography. You know, there were a lot of I remember 
what the, I remember dealing with these photographers in the beginning, uh, back in the day. And a lot of these guys that just wanted to take pictures to meet girls, you know, <laughs> that that's not a, you, you don't become a jazz photographer for that because the, the money's not good. Like we, we, you don't, we all have, what we share is, is just, is F8 and be there. We want to be there at the music. So uh, recently I've been, I was trying to, um, to shoot at a new club here in, in Bergen County where I moved to a year and a half ago from, from the city. And, um, you know, the person who's running it, I'm not giving names out, but doesn't want, doesn't want professional photographers. I kind of, he's had some because there's been some publicity, but he's a musician who I think he's been, um, he's, he's feels like he's been ripped off by photographers. And he was saying that, you know, like what, it, what, a, basically he doesn't want the photographer to take the pictures in the club and then own the work. You know, what am I getting out of it kind of thing. And mm. it, was, it was really, really very dispiriting for me. Cause I just wanted to, I was just excited that, that I don't have to go jump on a bus or, drive into the city, which is just a mile away across the bridge, but it's a hassle now that I'm not right in Manhattan, can't jump on my bike and go to gigs anymore with my camera bag in my basket. Um, and, and I was dispiriting because I just wanted a new place close by where I can, you know, where I can be shooting regularly. Mm -hmm. Like, no. <laughs> so, um, when you say he was ripped off by, he felt like he was ripped off by photographers. Uh, what does that consist of? I don't know. He just, he just doesn't trust photographers. He want, he doesn't, um, you know, the fact that a photographer will own the photo. He thinks that he has the, once you shoot it in his club or a film, he has the right <laughs> to it as much as the photographer does. That yes. didn't, we didn't get into a long back and forth. It was all by text. And it was very, very, very disappointing. I just wanted in the spirit of, you know, of community and, and, and here I am, a, a, you know, longtime jazz photographer with a, a pretty strong portfolio and of, of history. And I thought I was honoring him by saying, I, I'd love to come document, you know, the, the people performing at your club. And, and share the and share the and create some beautiful long lasting images that may not have any commercial value, but in his mind that, that you know we're we're out to like make all this money off of off of off of him or the, or the people at the club like what the hell you don't understand you know most of us are still you know right rapping I mean, right. You know, can, can, can you can you start the slideshow again and just let it run while we kind of have great some idea. conversation and end up yes because i idea. think like some people didn't see the whole thing and since okay. there's no sound on they can just yeah. watch it roll through i couldn't agree more you got it okay so there we go so yeah and then if anybody wants me to pause at something i'll be happy to so yeah but that's my story about about just understanding the I spoke to Fiona, she's still on this, about this more in depth. She couldn't believe it. <laughs> Cause you know, why wouldn't anyone want, you know, to, to have, to have a beautiful record of, of, of their, of the history of, of what they're presenting. And instead it was like, you know, I, I was really told no in a, in a kind of a, a really unfriendly way. <laughs> Yeah. So, Do you have stories about people who've looked at your work and gone, yes, we want to work with you further? Um, well, maybe. I'm, I'm not so sure those are really... Well, like your jazz, when Jazz Times was owned by Matabor or whatever, when, um, when they That's showed true. a gallery of your work, how That's did that true. show come about? Right. So more that was more jazz is that was the magazine that featured. Oh, me jazz on. is. I'm sorry. But 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 they did some galleries of my work too. But there was that gallery in Jazz Times, and the how that came about. Thank you for asking because I almost forgot about that. Was through Lee Tanner. He he was a very um, very generous enthusiast of my work. Out of all those men in that photo, <laughs> he was the only one. 
that embraced me and encouraged me and really appreciated what I was doing and, and, and made sure I knew that he, that he thought that I had some value, you know? I, I, excuse me, I like this one because of the 40 year difference. I know. And I think that that's really significant. If you could get people early and then see them later too, yeah. that's a useful yeah. thing. And I had, only, I only scanned the, the one that was 40 years ago recently. I had just, <clears throat> sometimes I, if I do get a request for a photo, uh, that's Milt Hinton, by the way, you know, on the left, who was a jazz photographer too. <laughs> Um, and I was honored to have a show at the 92nd Street Y a year after he had one. It was, it was a, like 50 photos in that show. But they had featured Milt Hinton uh, during their Jazz in July series. Oh. And I followed, up, I followed him that, the next year, thanks to Mitchell Feldman, who recommended me. Um, he was working there at the time. But yeah, um, but... but, but um, but yeah, as far as jazz times and everything, they didn't really, uh, it wasn't <laughs> for them. I, they weren't really calling on me and, and Lee Tanner did. I so, see. Yeah. Yeah, see that Jerry Allen one is the same as the, the silhouette one. It's the same session. Uh, but, and it looks very beautiful. beautiful. It looks beautiful in black and white too. But, and this is also backstage at Carnegie Hall with Roy and Sonny hand colors. I saw that show. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah. This show, I'm trying to remember. Roy was fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm glad you remember. I mean, geez, it's a miracle I remember where I, luckily I have things, you know, in my files, so I know where I shot them, but I don't remember the show. Um, thanks to the writers that write it down, right? Yeah. Now, yeah, and Sammy walked in, and then Sammy walked in. The one of Michelle Camilo, that was, that was another history because I I was so audacious at that time. I had just adopted Sammy, who was the little love of my life and still is. <laughs> He's still the little love of my life when I look back, you know. The little one. I didn't say the big one. He's the little one. But um maybe the big one too. But anyway, Sammy, um I I didn't want to leave him at home. I lived in Jersey City and I got the assignment to shoot Michelle for I think to found these maybe. Um, and I just, when I set up the shoot, I said, do you mind if I bring my dog? <laughs> he's, he's a really good dog. He, he's really well behaved. <laughs> and he said, so no problem. And I walked in, I told him what his name was. He said, and I said, this, this is Sammy. And he goes, you know, I just recorded an album with a song called, and then Sammy walked in. Mm -hmm. So I titled that photo and then Sammy walked in. Mm -hmm. I love doing titles, but that was a fun, a fun, um, notable, memorable experience for me. Michelle Camilo was a delight. And some of the some of the subjects that I worked with were much nicer than others. So I have, um, I think that comes through in the photos too. Most of them that I have shot, you know, backstage or personally were all wonderful, but I've had some not so great experiences with the musicians as well. And, uh, but you know, part for the course, I'm sure we all have. Mm. Any other questions or comments? Well, these are really cool, uh, Enid. Thank you. What are you shooting now most recently? Um, like in terms of, who I'm shooting or what? Oh, where have you been lately? Yeah, what have you done lately? Oh, what have I done lately? Oh my God, that's a good question. The most, yeah. well, you know, not as much as I, I would like to in terms of, in terms of the music photography, again, being, being across the river now, it's a little bit um, more effort at not, I was very spoiled oh, being able to get on my bike and just going from gig to gig and to the free gigs and you know Manhattan, you can't. You're a kid in a candy store. You don't know where to go next. So it's a little bit more, you know, more um, planned now. I've shot a lot recently in Newark at uh -huh. Clement's place, and it's part of Rutgers, and it's a really cool, wonderful little club that um, it's all free. They 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 
you can you can go there no cost you get free wine or soda or whatever you know no beer um but they um they have they have some wonderful shows there um and i just shot i think i just shot um well roberta pick of victor jones and um and alex blake uh, oh. several several different uh wonderful musicians there um and so that that's a, that's easy to get it's not that close but i can get in the car and don't have to worry about paying 17 dollars to go into the city and finding parking and whatever right so i do i've done that um the vision festival is coming up i hope to be shooting there i haven't even set that up yet to be honest um but i'll get there a few times and uh winter jazz fest the samara joy who everybody has incredible photos of She's hard to miss but that was fun for me to shoot recently, uh, her there. It was the second time I shot her and the lighting was just so much fun to work with. I almost felt like a rock photographer, you know, like mm. real stage lighting, which we don't always get in jazz as, as many of you know. So um, uh, I know I shot something else more recently. I, I just, yeah. You're I'm shooting fine. some festivals, aren't you, upstate? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's coming up too. Yay, Susan. Hi, Susan. Mm -hmm. and I are going together. I'm going to be shooting up in uh, the the uh, Rochester in Rochester, right? Rochester, Syracuse, yeah, Syracuse, <laughs> in, uh, Syracuse and Saratoga soon. Yeah. I have never shot um, the festival in Syracuse, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, that's you know just I'm going to take a little road trip with Miss Susan, and then come back and shoot a couple of days at Saratoga. Which you want to know something? those photos of miles and it's the first time I shot that the first year I came here in 85. I haven't been since, not to that festival. Enid, you did a whole series of the domestic and, you know, uh, jazz musicians in New York in their domestic environments, which is a really interesting series. We're, we're not really seeing that here. Mm -hmm. Wonderful photos, by the way. It's just that that was a, a really big project of yours for a while. Maybe you could tell us a little more about that or what, what you did with that. That would have been a good book, I think. Actually, but, I'm not even sure what you're referring to. I'm so sorry. What What are you... Uh, uh, oh, did you do... You did a whole series of uh, musicians in their domestic environment, you know, at home. I don't think it was me. Mm -mm. Not me. Seriously, you did? Oh, I made a, a mistake there? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I never did that. I mean, I just, by happenstance, have shot... Oh, really i'm sure it was you no i know i think you're talking you might be talking about um again my head is scrambled from falling today but oh. no um, I, i'm sure it was you i wouldn't make it about lordez delgado because she used to go into uh, homes with the big lordez yes lordez did that lordez delgado yeah i think it was so lordez. sorry you're right it's okay. i think lordez did that yeah, and yeah, Laura was... is a uh, retired from photography. She oh, did. really? Yeah, she moved to a small town outside Barcelona. Not a lot of jazz photography there, probably. And uh, she decided that she was just withdrawing from it. I'm sorry to say. Yeah. I understand. She's... I can understand why it's it's yeah. you know, it's hard to keep to keep going and and not necessarily having you know much to show for it. And yeah. Your fella Cootie one is iconic there. I think that oh, one is an absolute yeah. classic with the cigarette. Oh, yeah. That was that that there just just you know, another anecdote that you that you since you single that out, I'll give you the little anecdote that would be in the book about that. I was I was I came when before he came backstage, I was able to get snake my way backstage, get get into the dressing room where he was going to to be coming to momentarily, and it was very small, and, and get there and got down on, on my knees in front of the chair he was about to sit in. I don't know that I knew it was, that's where he was gonna be, but all of a sudden he comes in and then throngs of other people came in. I don't remember if there were any other photographers, but I do know that Donardo Coleman was standing behind me. <laughs> I'll never forget that, that was so cool. Um, but you know, I just sat there and, and fired off some photos uh, of him. Um, yeah, just talking to everybody, everybody wanting to, to get a piece of uh, Fela, but also had some other great fun shooting him with, with three of his wives, 
three of his 27 wives or two of them and one of his daughters and uh, I have lots of good material on Fela from the, I think two times I got to photograph them. Maybe a hand color project that one, that particular shot. I do um, have it hand colored. Oh, yeah. you do? I'd love yeah, to see yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there are a few in here that I have uh, that you're seeing that I have in hand color that you don't, you're not seeing in monochrome and, yeah. and some in monochrome that I do have in hand colored. And yeah, yeah, you know, some someday when I'm an older lady than I am now, because I'm already there and yeah. I'm sitting in my rocking chair and I have nothing to do. I might just take more of my old negatives and, and hand color them. I would like to hand color that one of Larry Harlow. I think that would be a fun one to hand color. <laughs> As opposed to the one of Sonny Chirac on the left. I, I and it's and not the one of Max and Billy. Um, you know, certain ones just just scream to me. Hang uh, Cap Gallery and Ray, they're they're really wonderful hand colored photos, especially the Ray because of the fruit, the grapes, you know, it's it's a really cool shot, hand colored. Mm -hmm. And this one of Mal Waldron, it looks good in, in hand coloring, but but it's it's probably better, a little bit better as a monochrome. I'm wondering um if you have a friend who knows the music, who who's got editing skills just to help you put something together. Because I know it can be daunting when you've got so much great material. Yeah. And yeah. you you know, get someone who has got a certain skill set to winnow out your stuff and help you because you've got so much wonderful stuff that should be in a book. You just need someone to muscle in and, um, and make it happen for you, you know. Send them my way, Michael. Send them my way, babe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? You know, I do know people, and I mean, I, I have a friend in publishing. She's in production, but she's not an editor. Yeah, I mean, I do know people, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'm good at it. What have I'm, you got? I'm not good oh, at it is marshalling these resources and like it like a like I'm a not even asking favors do you know what i mean this has never been my never been my forte a nephew or a niece or someone who oh gosh yeah, that yeah. yeah. <laughs> i have someone nephews that are very much into themselves and their world not and they're far away but you're right it, it would be great to find a collaborator uh, that has the time on their hands and the will to do that as well but you know everybody everybody's busy right mm. and has priorities yeah the photographer cindy bird was very helpful to me when i was selecting pictures for the one book of music photography that i did oh yeah who's just a colleague a colleague that will actually commit to spending the time with you mm. oh, well, who's speaking i'm sorry i don't see you. oh it's mark huh? me. it's mark Paul Kempner. Oh, Mark, I didn't even know you were on the call. I'm sorry. I don't see, I, for some reason, you don't, you're not coming up. Uh, there, there are too many of us. You're lucky. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> okay. So that's the end of the slideshow. Um, Enid, uh, stop sharing. Okay. Let's go back to see you. Okay. Oh, gosh. No there we are. And now I can see everybody too. That's why. For, for, oh, Bob Seymour's there. Bob, you got mentioned, babe. You got you and Andy. That's the that's the famous DJ who uh, who took me to. Now, Bob, can you just tell briefly? Um, hey, when I, I went to, when I, I when tuned you, in a few minutes in, just as you were describing my old house as a as a decrepit <laughs> hut with palmetto bugs. <laughs> uh, a pretty nice house with an exterminator exterminator <laughs> issue, but. Um, <laughs> What can we talk about Phil Woods concert? Did I shoot that? Did you? I, th I we will, we drove sixty miles to where I would later work at the University of South Florida. It was nineteen seventy eight, uh -huh. and I think what we did was go to a master class rehearsal in the afternoon. I don't, and I think probably I was having to work it and couldn't go to the evening concert. I don't think we went to the concert, but just the uh, master class and rehearsal. And what I recall, <laughs> do you remember how those shots came out? No, I don't. Probably with dust on Re them. Like, oh reversed. Oh, they did? So oh, I, I, I looked at it and said, something's not right. And um, the first batch of, uh, in those, that awful little bathroom, dark room um, of your first jazz shoot, uh, Phil's hands were reversed on the horn because of uh, they came out that way. But yeah, we, we so we shot the daytime um, rehearsal. 
or you you shot, I should say. But we it was about a hour hour drive each way to uh, go to that up in Tampa. When we were in Sarasota. Andy, I think Andy Croatman, I think left, but was here for most of the uh, session. And uh, yes, I remember you sitting on our couch when you first came in possession of a good camera. Yes. Through your lovely mother. Right. And um, I remember you sitting there and saying, I feel like I could do something with this. I did. You see, this and, um, witnesses because I. <laughs> like it was yesterday. Yeah, yeah, it's the it's a uh, so I think Andy and I are the charter members of your fan club, but uh, this is it's an ups so most of what we've seen, you know, is uh, uh, shots that I've seen over the years, and it's great to see some that I had never seen. But uh, it's overwhelming uh, how much you've uh, accomplished uh, over all those all these years. It's uh, congratulations. Thank you, Bob. So yeah, you she didn't even get into the uh, Jimmy. Oh, there you are. And <laughs> Ted Turner's shots, which are classics. There's and a Joe whole lot of non-music stuff that's. Oh uh, yeah, a lot of sports great. stuff from the Braves when yeah. she lived in Atlanta. That is true. That that that's good to. I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, I do value that work. I that was in my notes too. That I'm not just a jazz photographer. This is what I'm most known for. But you know, I, I again, I really value all that other photojournalism and, and, and dead christmas trees yeah dead christmas trees that is right now you know what bob was was what famous dj and program director that voice you know there's that voice <laughs> i'm sure some of you know that voice isn't that a great voice so uh yeah these are the voices. danny uh danny uh von Tobik wants to ask if uh, you would comment on the importance of light and color in your expression well, and I'm going to translate that to mean when you're out shooting, are you thinking about light and color or are you finding it more in the dark room or, you know, post post shooting? Oh, no. Well, but where did your eye go for that? Um, I mean, first of all, you've got a subject. It starts with the subject again, F8 and be there. Does anyone know? I, I want the other photographers to participate. I'm going to ask, I'm going to challenge them. Do, do, who can describe what I mean when I say F8 and be there? And it can be non-music photographers on this call. The, the most important thing. Right. And, <laughs> the and single we, most important thing, exactly. just be there. But what does it mean? What does it mean, Mark? What does it mean, F8 and be there? It just means show up. <laughs> No, it means more. That's just that's the that's the. Well, yeah, fate is uh, you know, that's the aperture you want to be at. Well, to get the uh, the best uh, depth of field. No, that's too literal. <laughs> well, <laughs> many, many many years ago, I I I got a partial scholarship to go to the main photographic workshops, and it was ridiculous because there was there were no, there were only white people there. There were no people of no diversity, and there was it was all about pretty scenes to shoot so but it was a good experience because the opening session they the the director of the workshop gave a speech and the thing that resonated with me then and still to this day was his was when he said f8 and be there and what he meant by that is you have to you yes you have to know the technology that's the f8 you have to know what you have to know how to work the camera right but you can't just be about what work in the camera you have it. The other equally important component is being there, being in the milieu, you know, being in the uh, finding your subject matter, to be honest. For me, it was it was mainly jazz. That was where I wanted to be. And in order to document jazz and the history and continue to do it and to spend my life doing it, it was I had to be dedicated to that no matter what, you know, for better or worse, like I said, paid gig or not gig, guest list or not guest list, magazine, you know, assignment or not. So, um, but you also had to have a, a enough of a, um, uh, of, of a comprehension of, of the technique, but you didn't have to be bogged down in technique. Was your mom or dad, um, you know, an influence. You mentioned you got a camera from your mom and your love of music. I mean, it so often comes from the forebears and parents, you know. 
because that's where you were drawn to. Were your parents uh, cool into music and everything? Um, so my my mother was was uh, had had a was was living with a a companion at the time who uh, was a you know an uh, amateur photographer, but he had several cameras. And um, I think what happened is uh, there they got they they got robbed or something, and uh, so he bought he he had one camera he still had an older camera and he got a new camera and he sent me the old camera so that's the first camera and how i ended up inheriting a camera uh, i was living in florida with uh, not with but uh nearby bob and andy and um i met bob because i went to a health food store and i had this camera and i was just taking pictures of the pretty scenes you know in sarasota florida where i lived for less than a year and uh, i went to a health food store and uh, I and I, I I saw a Bob Marley T-shirt in between the cans. They were they were they were on on like shelves, and in between the cans, there was a guy with a Bob Marley T-shirt with black hair, <laughs> not white hair. Well, this is how long ago it was. And um, I saw that T-shirt, and I went over there because I was big. I had I had been to Jamaica, and I loved Bob Marley, I loved reggae, and there was uh, Bob Seymour. And he started talking and I said, hmm, I like that voice. I recognize that voice. Found out he was the, the DJ on the overnight uh, jazz, uh, not jazz, but uh, NPR station. He was doing a jazz overnight shift and uh, we got to be friends. So he, he, he had his roommate, Andy, who had the dark room. And Andy was working, uh, doing traveling photos for, you know, families and babies. And, and he used to develop uh, a lot of his personal work, I think, in that dark room at the time. A Andy, or did you develop your, your commercial work or just the personal work? Whatever. Just uh, the personal, black yeah. and white. So I would sit on the toilet, hand him paper, like I said, and, and, and then he'd say, okay, kiddo, I'm going to bed. You take over. Am I right, Andy? That part I remember. And I would stay yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah, and uh, it, so that so that it was as far as the parent parental influence, um, Michael. I was more, yeah. There was music. My parents. I grew up in the South in Charlotte, North Carolina. My parents were into music big time, but jazz was you know it was Ella and Louie. It was it wasn't. I mean, they didn't have a huge. I mean, they knew the, the commercial jazz people. They loved Peter Nero. Peter Nero was a pianist. My brother played piano. He came over and gave him piano lessons when he was in Charlotte one time. So I just remember those as little early influences, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until I went off to college in Rhode Island for a year that I started, I took a jazz history course. Mm -hmm. And that's the year that I didn't have a professional camera yet, mm -hmm. but it was a year later when I got a professional camera or two, a year or two later, and my love of jazz and the love of photography became the perfect, you know, the perfect marriage for me. And once you got out of Sarasota and got up to Atlanta and started working with Chuck, that was a big step. That's true. Yeah, then I ended up in, in Atlanta uh, from Sarasota, got my darkroom job for Chuck Rogers, the one who shot the, the runners that were collapsed, that had collapsed after the Peachtree Road race where it was on billboards all over the world. And, um, but I was mainly his darkroom assistant or darkroom printer, not assistant. I did all his printing. So I really honed that craft there. And then I just kept shooting everything I could until I finally said, I got to go to New York. And I had not much to, you know, not much to go, to go. Uh, I mean, I didn't have any money. <laughs> Again, I keep going back to that. It's true. I just went there because uh, I was bold and young and I uh, had a few names. And I think Howard, I met you pretty early on. I don't know if I was, oh yeah, there's there's an old, there's, there, there's my, yeah, one of my old uh, baseball photos. I was pretty uh, daring. I would, I would, I would go down to the, the, uh, oh yeah, I've got, I've got some, I've got some really incredible history of, of uh, card of Jimmy Carter with Ted Turner. Yeah. That was Dale Murphy there. Yeah, no, but I Bruce Benedict. 
Yeah, we'll, the we'll, have to, we'll have to see those on another session. <laughs> <laughs> it's we better wrap this one up. It's been I just had to throw right at my fingertips. <laughs> yeah, that's you're how important have, stuff. You're lucky they have these fans, lifelong fans of yours. Well, that's pretty amazing. They've been to do your Mark fans. Ruffin thing with what was Mark Ruffin's book, uh, baseball, jazz, and um, something you know, his book of stories. Yeah, a three piece with your baseball photos, your jazz. It could be an all American kind of Ken Burns catch all, you know. Yeah. yeah. Then you then you got. We're yeah. going to, to be publishing this. It sounds like he's hot on this idea. <laughs> yeah, so we we're going to list you. We need to talk, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Edith, thank you so much for doing the session today. Um, and we will edit it up uh, for a later YouTube uh, archival version. Um, and uh, um, it's wonderful to be able to see all these images. And I do hope you're going to get a book out of this at some point in the not too distant future and then move on to another one. Well, let's talk, Howard, from your mouth. Okay. Yours. We're talking now. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody, for being here yeah. at this uh, Seeing Jazz session. And Thanks. we'll have another one in another month.